Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the Empower Podcast. This is the podcast where Steve and I um, talk with people in the industry or people looking to get into the video game industry. Um, we notice that there's some common um, kind of misconceptions or pitfalls in people that are early career, and we just like to address those and help out people whenever we can. Um, I'm Byron. I'm a software engineer at Encore, Steve's uh, recruiter, Onward Play. And we have a special guest with us today, um, Donovan Alcones, who's actually a music composition student at University of San Diego. Um, Steve and I have been uh, mentoring him for about a month now, and it's become pretty clear that he has a drive to get into the industry. Um, so that we thought it would be cool to bring, it on, bring on a guest who brought in the perspective of someone who's still in school. That's something that we haven't done before. Um, so yeah, Donovan, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and give us a little bit of uh, your background? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Donovan. Uh, like you said, I go to University of San Diego. I major in music comp. Um, I play the euphonium, trombone, piano. Uh, I actually just had a concert yesterday. Uh, that's why I've been a bit MIA. I've had like four projects due the same week as a concert, and I still had to practice. So, um, you know, sort of a hell week, but it's whatever. Uh, let's see. Uh, is there any other information you need for like an introduction? Um, yeah, I mean, kind of, I'm kind of curious. I know you're a student at, uh, at UCS, USD. Um, what's your background in music? Most people in music probably have been doing it their whole lives. And what's your relationship for video games been up to this point? So, uh, I'll start with the music background. Uh, I play, I started in the elementary school band at Sandberg. I started on alto sax, which at the time I only thought was a saxophone. And then I learned that there were like six different types. Um, after fifth grade, I went to Challenger Middle School, and since you're in middle school, they think you're able to play more instruments, and they need to fill in those spots, so I chose to pick up the euphonium, mm -hmm. um, which I describe as a tiny tuba to everybody that doesn't know, like, the wind ensemble instruments, uh, and I've been on it ever since, so I've been playing the euphonium for, like, three, seven, ten years now, I think. Um, I'm not terrible. <laughs> uh, I picked up the trombone in eighth grade to play jazz, and I played bass trombone in the pit orchestra starting my freshman year of high school and then I picked up or I started taking piano lessons like my seventh grade uh since seventh grade actually mm -hmm. yeah um I started taking theory lessons uh same time as my piano lessons but it was like pretty minor stuff uh and I actually took AP music theory in uh my sophomore year of high school but I didn't take the test until senior year fun fact I didn't study for that test but I still got a five on it oh wow <laughs> wow cool yeah um, the oral skills was really hard though. I'm not very good at oral skills, uh, which is funny because I'm joining choir next semester. So that's <laughs> cool. Uh, for a video game, I remember, I think it was like kindergarten, first grade, somewhere around that time I got my first console. It was a Wii. My first game was Mario Kart Wii shortly after I got a Game Boy. And my first game on that was, I think, Pokemon Fire Red or Leaf Green. Oh, one of those two Pokemon games. Nice. Uh, uh, I later moved on to the DS, where I played a bunch of games. I think Starfield was one of the first, like, games I played on it. And then I started playing um, Wind Waker on my cousin's GameCube. And ever since then, I've been playing a bunch of Legend of Zelda games. Legend of Zelda Pokemon, those are some big um, influences for me. Um, and then I got an Xbox. Uh, at first, I was like, FPSs are so, like... I attribute that to like the type of people I don't like talking to. And then I started playing Halo <laughs> and I was like, wait, this is actually really fun. <laughs> so I started playing Halo, Skyrim, and then I picked up Destiny. And then when Destiny 2 came out, I started playing Destiny 2. Um, and then Fortnite came out uh, and that was pretty fun. I only played the first three seasons. I, after that, I started playing Apex. Mm -hmm. um, and now I play Genshin and uh, just running through all the games on my Switch and PS5 and stuff. So that's my music and uh, video game background. Right on. And like one of the things that uh, that I love to hear is that you've got passion to play video games and you also know that you have a passion for music. And I know you're in the stage of your education right now where you're kind of figuring out what careers you want to get into. And can you go into a little bit of that and like what is it that you, you think that you want to do right now and, and why? Yeah, so I really want to go into uh, music composition for video games, uh, writing the music for it, because um, I'm really big into writing. I'm a, I like to think of myself as a creative person, um, and I think it'd be really cool to create like the sound, 
uh, the sonic aspect of a game world. I think that's really interesting. And one of my life goals is to create a video game magnum opus in which I design the game and write the music for it. Uh, awesome. And it hopefully code some of it because I'm still working on the coding aspect of the job. Very cool. And then yeah. with with those types, can you go a little more into the type of game that you that you want to create? Because it sounds like you've put a lot of thought into this already, right? And I can see the gears <laughs> turning in your head and that you've thought about a lot of the details that you want to go into this game. Um, can you like describe that to us? Like what type of game is it? What type of music would you put into it? Yeah, so I'm really interested in open world games where you get to um, you know, just discover what you'd like and create what you like. I mean, sort of influenced by Minecraft was my first, or technically Legend of Zelda is my first open world game next to Pokemon. Um, and then after that, I played Skyrim and then also Minecraft. So those are sort of formative to like my influences as a, a video game player. Um, as for like how it's going to be structured, I like I it'd be cool to use like a, a, like a magic world, but like having an FPS open world similar to how Destiny works would be pretty cool too. Mm-hmm. Open world is basically the the thing sta- like tying everything together though. So open world games are probably your favorite then, right? Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. And then so I see that you've got the vision for how you want your career to pan out. Where are you now in your educational journey? Uh, your professional journey and then what are the steps that you're taking in order to get to your ultimate goal yeah so right now i'm working with an old high school alum to release a game that he worked on for a game jam um i'm only writing like two pieces for it but it's still something because i get to write for like something on screen um after that there's this game jam that i should be in i think so uh steve connected me with him his name's carlos uh it's for the yuri game jam i'm really excited for that one uh, don't know how the game is going to be designed just yet, but I'm willing to put in my all because this is technically my first uh, game jam. Um, for education, right now I'm in, uh, let's see, an orchestration class, and I still take composition lessons. Next semester, um, they're offering uh, sounds, uh, art in the soundscape, which is more based around um, music programming, mm-hmm. uh, like for the computer, not like symphony programming. Um but I, unfortunately, I can't take it because since I'm joining choir for the scholarship, it's going to be in the same time slot. So my uh, the head of the department was like, how about this? We give you independent study and you get to choose a professor you get to work with. So I'm going to choose a music tech professor cool. and then we're, we're going to work on uh, like learning all the stuff. So I want to work, learn uh, Wise, Pro Tools, uh, Finale eventually. Not that I'm going to be doing a lot of script uh, um, transcription for the job, at least not yet. Um, and then... You usually learn DSP, I think that's what it's called, in his class. So I'm just going to try to take as much like music tech-related stuff so that I could um, get in. I know that a lot of composers in the field also double up as like audio implementers, sound tech, uh, sound design, that sort of thing. That's awesome, man. It sounds like uh, that's a really good direction to go into. Um, I love that stuff, too. And you're, you're correct. DSP is the right term for it, digital signal processing. Um, basically it refers to the kind of audio effects that you would apply to your music, to your sound effects, stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I think that's going to be a really great opportunity. And I heard you mentioned WISE. Um, I know we talked a few weeks ago about WISE. Um, mm-hmm. um, so for, for those of you guys who don't know, WISE is basically, it's called an audio middleware program, which allows you to kind of be self-sufficient in handling some of the more interactive aspects of audio and music implementation without having to bother a programmer. So it's pretty helpful to be able to prototype your ideas without having the skills to actually build the game to test out those interactive components. Gotcha. And thank you so much for for providing some insight into the audio world of making video games because I that's not something that I am an expert in in particular. So for you guys to kind of discuss these things uh, to the audience, that that's absolutely fascinating for me. Um, and I'm sure for the audience as well. And I know that, uh, l- let's go back a little bit into um, Donovan and Byron actually getting to know each other. Cause I know that this is part of the journey for everyone is like, okay, you're finding people to, to help you out in your career. Um, Donovan, what was the whole process of you getting connected with us in general? And what was that journey like for you? Yeah, so um, not going to go into like the deep, deep origins, but it started with uh, the same high school alum. 
uh, that I'm working on a game with, uh, he sent me an application to the music inter- music production internship at Sony um, for PlayStation here in San Diego. And he was like, I know that you're trying to get into uh, game composition, so I thought I'd send this over to you. And I was like, wow, thank you. Um, and we kept in touch. I was like, if you ever need me to do anything in return, let me know. I write music. So if you need music, just let me know. Uh, after that, I looked at the application and I tried finding who in my connection pool uh, currently works there or has worked there. Not surprising, not a lot of USD people work at the PlayStation Studio, but I did find Kane, who I went to high school with, um, on there. So I messaged him and I was like, hey, I know you work at PlayStation. I was wondering if you'd be able to give me some pointers on how to or what they'd like to see in like a resume in the cover letter. Um, And he was like, hi, I'm not actually sure how much use I'd be of you, but I do know somebody who could help you. His name's Byron. So he sent me his profile and he was like, I'll let him know that you're going to be messaging him. So the next day I then messaged Byron and then we had like an hour, hour and a half talk talking about like um, video game audio technology stuff. Um, That's where I first learned about why is an audio middleware and actually how much technical information I have to learn because previously I was purely music. Um, The only coding that I had to do was... Uh, Ableton, which I didn't think I would, or I knew I'd be using a lot, but I wasn't sure how much. And then MuseScore for like scripting, uh, for uh, transcriptions and stuff. And then afterwards, Byron was like, let me get you connected to Steve too, so that you can talk to him about stuff. And then that's when I met, um, talked to Steve. Um, and I sent him like my resume and my cover letter. And then I met with him again afterwards, just to make sure everything was good. And I sent it in. Um, and now we're here. <laughs> that's awesome. And let's yeah. go a little bit deeper into that as well. Um, I know that I'm not sure what you and Steve discussed, but I know when mm-hmm. you and I talked, um, I know I provided some resources. So do you kind of want to go into uh, some of the things that you've gone that you've done since our meeting um, to kind of get you to where you want to uh, want to be? Yeah. So um, I know one of the big things is that once uh, I know I paid attention to like the music aspect of uh, video games, but when I started playing video games again after that. Um, I started paying attention to like all the sonic as- aspects of the world and take into account like all the technical stuff like where is the sound located um, what are the dynamics like um, how would you create this sound uh, sound profiles I know are pretty important when you work with ele- uh, with DAWs like Ableton so I tried to process that a bit faster um, and actually try writing things down writing things down my professors always tell me, you should write things down. And I was like, okay, I'll get to it eventually. And then I <laughs> completely forget whatever I was thinking about. So I now have a, like, a little notebook, or at least this little notepad. Uh, it's from the school. I rip pages out of it, and then I transcribe it onto uh, OneNote, Microsoft OneNote, so that I could access it wherever I need to. Um, I started looking at the WISE uh, certification stuff uh, on the website mm-hmm. the test itself is like 200 bucks per certification test so i'm just looking at the material i don't That's <laughs> i'm not fine. gonna pay for the test just yet yeah yeah um he also told me about game sound con and game developer con um haven't signed up for gdc yet but for game sound con it just happened like monday and wednesday of last this week which would be like the sixth and eighth i think um i went to the first day in person not in person like in person online um because that was a bunch of the beginner stuff, like composing for interactive music, the business of music, uh, uh, music and video games, uh, stuff like that. Uh, it was really informative. I met a, well, I didn't meet meet people, but I interacted with them a lot on the Zoom chats. Um, I'm a bit of a jokester, so I sort of sent in jokes mm-hmm. <laughs> um, to sort of, I don't know, make people laugh. I like to think that the smartest people in the room are often the funniest as well, because they got <laughs> the quick wit. It's true. Um, I, I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and then the Whova app is actually really interesting. It's like you're in the, uh, Whova is how they hosted most of the conferences, but they, like, put it on Zoom so that, like, the quality is better or something like that. Mm-hmm. I don't know why they use Zoom specifically. Um, but it's like you're in the convention center, like, digitally, so, like, I'm able to, like, digitally go into, like, all of the, uh, booths, and then they have, like, all these separate, like, uh, forums where you could talk to other creators and people within the industry, um, there was one that was uh, Asian Game Audio Network. That one was some... They were trying to start it, and then I joined the Discord channel, and like now it's at like 80 people, I think. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, their goal is to like mentor peop- uh, Asian people trying to get into um, the game industry, which I think is really cool because, um, I don't know, there's not a lot of information like free for you to get. Like All the information I have on the industry is pretty much whatever I got from Steve and Byron. So, I mean, there's stuff to read online too, but like all the 
things I found pretty useful were the ones that you guys told me. And I, like, keep notes of, like, all the end times we've interacted with each other, like, formally. Um, like, I have, on Microsoft OneNote, I have careers in music, which is what my school has for the panels. And I have, like, 20 pages of, like, people that I've met with um, and, like, composition ideas. Actually, composition ideas is on a separate page, but that's also, like, around 20 pages. Um, and I started using Ableton way more because I know I'm going to be using it. <laughs> So I'm using it for the game I'm working on right now. I'm not just using instrumental samples. I'm like developing my own instruments using uh, Simpler and the Operator. Cool. Which are pretty oh, much the operator. only two I know how to yeah. use. Yeah. <laughs> so those are pretty fun. I also found out about plugins. So I need to figure that out eventually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dude, and that's, that's where I am that, pretty much. That, that is, I love hearing that part of your journey, how you're keeping notes of all of the ideas that you have. Because I know as somebody as creative as you, there's just ideas and ideas going on all the time in your head and it's so easy to just kind of forget about it. like what was what was that thing that i was thinking about so mm -hmm. just having one note in particular that's huge is something that i love to use as well um so that that's such some that's such cool insight into your thought process um and then going into like the ideas that you have and the cool things that you're learning can you talk about what are some of the things that you're getting uh like the things that you're learning that they're not necessarily teaching you in school. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. I know there's so many different sources of information and guidance that you're getting. What stuff that you're getting outside of the school, uh, your school education? Yeah, so I think I'll start this with what USD does provide so it gives some insight into what I'm getting outside of school. Um, USD, University of San Diego, um, is very academic. They have a very strong ethnomusicology program. The head of ethnomusicology study in Bali studying gamelan percussion ensembles. Um, all the professors are like amazing. Um, my only issue is that everything is super academic. So when I asked about video game music, my composer or my composition professor, um, he didn't really know exactly how to help me that much. Um, but he's a session artist some, uh, and he writes music for uh, ensembles. So. He was like, um, I can help you with like some of the coding, with some of the business aspect, aspect uh, aspects of stuff like publishing, uh, PROs, um, stuff like that. Um, but in terms of like actually working with video games, all I can do is help refine your compositional skills, which is okay. I, I do need that assistance. Um, and when I spoke with the ethno ethnomusicology uh, professor, she was like, you should look into ludomusicology, which is like the academic study of game audio, specifically music. Um, so I started reading some articles on that. Um, but again, it's all like academic stuff and we don't have a very strong music tech program. We have three music tech courses. One is offered every spring and then one is offered every four semesters. And then the last one is offered after that fourth semester. So it's like Music 420, Music 421, Music 422. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I wanted to take Music 421 because I wanted to learn all the coding aspects of music technology. Um, so what I'm doing outside of school, which is sort of hard because I take 18 credits every semester. <laughs> Um, and ensembles uh, is that, uh, like I said before, I'm learning WISE on my own. Uh, I'm trying to find game jams and games to work on so that I can put my work onto the screen uh, or with stuff on screen rather. Um, and I'm trying to practice a lot more analysis of the stuff that I that I listen to because unfortunately my classical repertoire is not that strong. Like you could play some classical pieces and be like, oh, this I know this composer, but as for who like what the actual piece is, no, I I won't know it. Um, so I'm trying to supplement that. I'm trying to work on soundtracks. So um, I've been heavily analyzing the Genshin soundtrack because it's like sort of like a nice bridge between like the classical world and the soundtrack world. Um, I'm sorry to all the film buffs out there, but I find film to be sort of a boring medium. I don't like films that much. So that's why I sort of, I'm focusing on like uh, serials like um, Ivan Sirachu and Steven Universe. They're a big influence on like my writing and sound design too. Um, and then obviously Skyrim, Minecraft's pretty cool. Um, Breath of the Wild has some pretty interesting stuff. If you guys know about Steve Reich, um, he's a minimalist composer that lived in the 20th century, and I think he's still alive right now. Um, Breath of the Wild's music reminds me a lot of Steve Reich's work, so like I, I sort of like mix up the two whenever I do write my own music. Um, so yeah, a lot of studying on my own, in addition to getting my degree done. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, cool. wow. Yeah. Wow, that's um, that's quite the uh, the breakdown. So thank you for that. Um, and then one of the things I also wanted to to talk about is that Byron in particular um, went to school at San Diego State, and there was no formal game development program there. Um, is there anything like that that's offered at USD? 
Yeah, so uh, CS, uh, computer science, is pretty big over there. Uh, they don't have any game-centered, centric uh, courses. I think there was one that was like object design, but that's not, I don't think it's animation. I haven't looked into it. Um, and then there's also the art department, but I don't know if any, there is an animation course there, but I think it's only one course. Um, so the way I'm trying to supplement that is trying to create also a game development club at USD. We haven't came up with the name yet because the gaming club over there is called Trero Gaming, and then they have an esports club there too that branched off from it. Um, and I was going to be the Trero Gaming Labs or Trero Gaming Studios, but since they're TG, we'd be like TGS or TGL. So I was like, we'll just come up with a different name. Um, right now it's a bunch of CS majors, uh, a lot of programmers. There's like one musician or two musicians technically, but the other one's going to be more of a programmer. We have one writer, no artists yet. I'm trying to recruit artists right now. <laughs> um, you need 10 people to start a club and I have nine. So I just need like one more person to join and then we'll be able to get officially started in the spring. Um, I'm tr that's also why I'm trying to learn as much as possible because a lot of them don't know how to use Unity or Unreal. Um, and one of the people in esports was like, I can't join the club because I graduate this semester, but I know how to use Unity because she's getting a job in video games. Um, so she's going to come back and try to help us uh, learn it. We're probably going to spend the entire first spring working on one game uh, or at least learning how to make a game. And then the next uh, fall, we're going to try to, uh, or at least I'm going to try to get them to do one game like in half a semester instead of one whole semester um, mm -hmm. or faster. I, I College students are a lot smarter than I remember than high school students. So like they'll pick up things a lot faster. And I always forget that. Like whenever I make these offhand jokes, like a super... Um, what's the word a super it's not it's like a super niche reference to like parks and record the office they're like oh i remember that episode and then like they start describing cut. the episode to you <laughs> yeah like a super deep cut and i'm like oh right these people are also smart um <laughs> so yeah <laughs> yeah that's cool that's awesome man um let me know how i can help i'm sure steve's willing to help as well um mm -hmm. with supporting this club i know steve did the same thing with us um, even before he went back to finish his degree, he'd actually be, he was actually a, a regular speaker at um, our um, organization in San Diego State. So um, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, it sounds like you're on a pretty similar path to myself, to be honest. So you're going to probably mm -hmm. come out pretty well-rounded in development by the end of this beyond just the music composition and like the sound chops too. I sure hope so. Maybe I'll become like a Toby Fox and release my own game. <laughs> Toby Fox, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And one of the things that I kind of want to emphasize a little bit to all of the listeners out there is that Donovan is at a school where there's no like formal game development program. So he's helping create one from scratch. And the fact that he's got the, the courage to do something like that and the organizational skills to go out and recruit people and con convince them to join them, to join him in this journey to create a club those are some of the soft skills that companies love, right? Because when you're looking at job descriptions, don't they always have that little bullet point that says self-motivated, connects well with others, uh, communicates effectively? Like the things that Donovan is doing right now is a prime example of what those job descriptions are asking for. And Donovan, I know, is taking notes on all of this where he's – he has to recruit people to join him for this club. He has to lead them in the discussion and the topics in creating these games. And these are things that he can put on his resume moving forward that are extremely valuable, right? Because he's got evidence of him being a leader. Like anybody can put a bullet point on the resume that says they're a leader. But if you're a leader, who are the people that are actually following you? Mm -hmm. And this is something that Donovan can literally list out. Here are the 10 people that I recruited to start this, this, uh, this game uh, development group. These are the projects that I led them on, whether it was creating a game in a few weeks or a few months, semester, whatever it is. But this is like actual tangible evidence that he's not only passionate about it, like not only does he have the feeling, but he's got the discipline to go out and execute. And that's one of the the things that's going to separate Donovan from all of the other candidates out there that are applying for jobs is that he doesn't just talk the talk, but he walks the walk. So um, just one of those things where a lot of people don't take that in into consideration that starting a club can actually be used as a significant bullet point on their resume, but it absolutely is. So thank you for sharing that. Um, mm -hmm. And then going forward into some of these, uh, into the club that you want to start, 
um, can you tell us and tell the listeners like what are the goals that you're uh, that you're looking to accomplish, and how can people out there possibly contribute to you achieving that goal? Yeah, so uh, one of the things you have to do to start a club at USD is to have a a club constitution. So I've wrote out some of the goals, and I can't pull it up. I'm gonna pull it up right now, really quick. Um, I know the one that I remember off the top of my head is that um, the goal of the uh, to be a, a named group uh, is to network with uh, other people trying to get into the industry within the school and uh, people that are currently in the industry as well. I, I worded it a lot better in the email, but um, a big, I think in the past podcast, you were like, it's not about who you know, it's more about who knows you. And I think that's <laughs> a lot, that's a way better way to say it because if you know somebody, um, it's not like you can just be like, hey, uh, do you have any jobs? It's like, that's not really <laughs> the best way to go about things. Like, I think, th- or at least all the opportunities that I've had so far is because you guys know me and uh, other people on LinkedIn know me and other people in my college and high school know me. They're like, hey, there's this guy that needs music for something. Can you do music for that? And I was <laughs> like, yeah, of course I could do music for that. Are they paying? Just kidding. I'll do the music. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so... Um, there's that first part, and I'm trying really hard to pull up this game thing without making too much clicky noises on my laptop. Uh, game dev club. Alexandra. Is the goal for this to start up, I guess, are you guys on, like, the semester system, start next semester? Yeah, it's next semester. Uh, we passed the date for us to start, um, a club. There's, like, specific courses you have to go to and event planning, um, so that you can host, uh, general body meetings. Um, Mm -hmm. I found it. It's the first email that I sent was, I'm looking to start a club to help aspiring game developers and designers, anyone really looking to get into the video game industry, learn and practice skills that they'll be using in the workforce, as well as network with others. Um, That's what I wrote down. Uh, And I also know that in the video game industry, there's a lot more than just like the actual design and development part. I know there are people that that are trying to get into um, marketing. I think I met like two people at the IGDA uh, Mixer uh, they're both marketers. One works for like, um, this glasses or the, like the gaming glasses company. And then the other one works for Nexus, which is more for, uh, like creator It's like a creator platform or something like that. I wish I could remember what he said a lot <laughs> more clearly. Um, but I got his card. I think his name is Sam Hall. I saw him. I am now his connection on LinkedIn. Pretty cool. I guess. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, yeah, goals. Uh, those are pretty much the main goals right now. So we're just trying to get started and like get the foundational skills so that when I eventually graduate, the people that are still there can just pass on the skills without me having to like come back and be like, Oh my God, this club is like out of order. I need to get back and do stuff like that. Um, cause I've had a club, like two clubs like that in high school that ended up just dying after I left, mm-hmm. which is a shame because they stood for good stuff in the school. One of them was the journalism club. Um, the marquee was the name of our newspaper and we covered a lot of stories. Me being, an arts person I was very biased towards like performances on campus so that's pretty much what I covered um and the other one was the gay uh the gay straight alliance which I wanted to rename to the gender sexuality alliance because it's a lot more inclusive that way um club also uh dissipated after I left which is a shame because like we organized like this pretty big thing on campus called day of silence where like um you would um take all your classes in silence um, in order to stand with the people that have been silenced themselves by, um, the community and the, um, society, stuff like that. Um, so things will be different here. And also this is a lot more technical. So like things have to be passed down. So like, it's not really that like they have a choice. It's like, if we want to like keep putting stuff on our portfolio, we need to teach the new people how to do their job. So. Gotcha. Yeah. And like, um, what a coincidence, we have somebody who started a club at San Diego State and was able to, uh, to not only create it from the ground up, but also to uh, have it continue to run even after he left. So I'm curious, Byron, for, uh, for Donovan and for all of the other listeners out there, any tips and hints on how to create a club and then organize it in a way where it will continue even after, uh, after the organizers leave? I think the biggest thing is keeping the momentum going, um, keeping a mm-hmm. consistent pace. Um, when we first started, we were kind of just kind of seeing what stuck, what stuck, which is important. I think we did surveys to see what people were interested in. Um, and for us, like Kane and I talked a lot about this. We were kind of worried that people wouldn't be willing to do a, a full game. But we realized that was exactly what they wanted to do. 
Mm-hmm. So we just kind of cut out some of the stuff that maybe wasn't uh, gaining traction and focused on just the development. So we started doing, like you mentioned, semester long projects. People were even dedicated enough to do projects over the summer, which is cool. So the way that we specifically um, had our, our club structured was fall semester would be a four month long project. As soon as uh, you reach your winter break, we're done. Then we do a more ambitious project in the spring that would lead into the summer. And then we'd use that project to kind of present to people in the following semester to hopefully get them interested in um, participating consistently in the club for that for the next year. Dude, that's awesome. And then um, another part of this is finding the people to succeed you as leaders. Yeah. And I know that was one of the biggest part you mentioned that Kane in particular was somebody that uh, showed the initiative mm-hmm. and was willing to take the reins. So like, how did that how did how did it evolve to be it being Kane? Was there like an election or was it just he volunteered? Like what's something that Donovan can do um, to just keep an eye out for so that he can cultivate the successors that will come after him? Yeah, so it's kind of an election, but it also it's what I get what I mentioned a couple of times, which was consistency. So, Steve, you've talked a lot in the past about leaders aren't just people with the official title. Um, and so a big thing for me was kind of nurturing those people that you saw were showing up consistently um, because it's pretty common for the club to start out with 50, 60, 70 people to show up. But how many people are there on week four? How many people are still there after midterms? And those are the people that you want to make sure are, are, um, you want to talk to them and be like, hey, um, elections are coming up. We have X, Y, and Z positions. Um, Kane was one of those people. He was really consistent. He impressed me early on with the first game he made. And um, I could just tell he was sharing the same frustrations that I did with the direction. So, um, and unfortunately, I was too busy at the time. I was working. I was missing half the meetings for a semester. And so I was like, hey, Kane, like, why don't, it, why don't you just talk to the people in charge since they're, they're pretty busy? And um, that was kind of how we got started with, um, you know, the new direction. And then at that point, we've officially voted at him in as the president for the club for the next like two years. Dude, that's so cool. And then like Donovan, I know that you've already with that talk that Byron gave, uh, you've already got in mind who are some people that you would love to um, to just kind of be the other leaders within this group. Um, I'm curious, what other questions do you have in particular? Uh, is, is there anything and Part of this is so that you can voice it out and so that all the listeners can kind of be like, okay, who are the people that we know that might be able to help out? Because I'm already, I've already got ideas in my head, but for you, can you go a little deeper into that? Yeah, um, I know that what you said, momentum was a big thing. I like the, the, the structure that you had planned out where like you get started in the fall and then break in the winter and then spring, um, you do a more ambitious project and then you recruit for like the summer and also work on other stuff. Um, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I think actually for the next spring, I was going to choose like a super easy, like game idea, like maybe not even give them the chance to choose something. I'm just going to be like, we're going to work on a platformer and it's going to be so much fun. It's only going to be three levels and it's going to be so easy. And it's just to build confidence in the system because once they feel that accomplishment, they're going to be like, wow, wow, let's keep working on stuff. Um, But uh, in terms of like the leadership thing, I think that's going to be one thing I'm going to have some issues with because since I haven't worked with anyone just yet, any any of the people I've networked with, um, I might have some issues. And one of the issues I had before in trying to show leadership is that I don't want to overstep boundaries. Like when there are set leaders, I don't want to like encroach on their power to like show respect to their position, but also um, not to gain any negative attention as to like when I eventually try to get leadership positions of like, oh, he like took over the project anyways. Like why would we want such a bossy person? How would you like tackle people that have like sort of the same mindset? Um, that like they don't want to overstep boundaries but they have leadership qualities you just can't like see them on the surface um like for yourself in particular or... uh yeah or like just trying to find people to take over for you like looking for future leaders um i think that we literally just asked is anyone willing to uh be a lead for this specific position for programming because like in the club's particularly we had like a treasurer we had like a president vice president um outreach 
Um, so those are leadership positions. But in terms of the development, I think we specifically reached out to people on like our Discord or our Slack and said, is anyone interested in um, kind of spearheading the programming side of things or this design system? So I really wouldn't be too concerned with that. Um, you'll probably get a couple people interested and um, I just really think that it's going to be finding that balance and mm. only you can kind of determine what that is. But um, yeah, I think that's really cool. And then also um, in terms of finding people to help out with the club, something I forgot to mention that I did um, every week was reaching out to different departments. I actually found like the heads of the departments and I'll be like, hey, uh, we want to get people from the club. Can you forward this email? Because we had uh, we used MailChimp to send out a weekly um, a weekly like le letter or notice to people that, hey, here's the club. Here's what we're going in or here's what we're doing. Here's what we did last week. And the professors were more than happy to forward that email to the department so all the students mm -hmm. could see it. Yeah, uh, I did something similar too, or I tried to send out as many as I could. Um, I sent out emails to the Artist Society. They're just waiting on a poster for me. I'm not very good at graphic design, so I actually asked somebody <laughs> else to make that for me. Um, I also spoke to ACM, which is like the CS majors uh, club on there. Um, I spoke with the, um, the people at the USD FUSO, which stands for the Filipino Ugnayan Society Organiz or Student Organization. I finally memorized it. I think in a past talk I mentioned it to the both of you, but I couldn't remember what the SNO stood for. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm just, once I get that flyer sent out, I'll send it to the commuter commons and then eventually the student org. I'm trying to like get as many people in as possible. Um, I need to overcome sort of my own bias, sort of my own insecurities too, I guess, because I didn't send it out to the music department because I sort of wanted to be the only person working on music. But I know that's not going to be the case for all projects. So I just need to like get over myself and just send it. And just be like, hey, I want to work on music. And I'll just be like, great, that's fun. <laughs> yeah, I would. Yeah. You know, I know you can talk to that, Steve, because you've mentioned similar things when you worked in QA, right? Like the me mentality versus the us mentality and helping people out. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of those. It's just a part of growing up in general is mm -hmm. that when like when we're born we're dependent on other people and we need others to get everything that we want so it, you grow up and you have a very selfish mentality just by design because you can't get anything yourself but like the true sense of maturing as an individual and as a professional is understanding one how to get things on your own but then also how to help others get what they want right and then breaking out of the just me 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 mentality and then thinking about uh, what they call in the seven habits is what's a win-win. So how do I get what I want and how do I other, help other people get what they want? And I think that's one of the things where, especially working in an organization for you, is I love that you're already coming to that conclusion naturally where it's not just what you want in, mm -hmm. in particular, but like how are you doing things that are good for the group in general? So you understand that by bringing other musicians into the group that the whole this is this is one of the ways to get the group to to be able to survive even without you because once you graduate and once you move on you're going to need other musicians in the group as well right so right. it's like you're already coming to this conclusion naturally and i i just love seeing this group or seeing this uh, this growth in you even under you know short uh, short time frames um, because i know that's just going to magnify even moving forward and as you bring these people in um, you're going to understand, I mean, you already, you already came to the conclusion that like, if there's skills that are needed, but I don't have them, I need to find other people. You said that right. with like the graphic designer, right? Mm -hmm. And that's going to be the same exact thing because you need so many different, uh, skill sets in order to put, uh, put a game together. And mm -hmm. again, these are things that you're, these are leadership lessons that you're learning because you're being a leader right now. Right. Um, so this is. That's something that I'm excited to do is like have this conversation in a few weeks or a few months to see how the mentality has has evolved more and to see the growth and progress of your club. So thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Um, and is it OK if I say something? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So I, uh, when you said uh, can't like came to that conclusion naturally, um, I just want to say that like a lot of what I've learned, like like in terms of like character, personality and like being a good person, a lot of that comes from reading fiction 
Uh, and I know a lot of people in my life are sort of like, oh, I don't really read fiction. Sometimes I watch TV. But I was like, no, you need to, like, consume as much fiction as possible because that's where you get sort of, like, the lessons of, like, like even philosophers like Plato and Socrates, they use, like, fiction to, like, help tell their stories. Like, um, actually, I'm not going to bring up that one. But Plato's cave allegory where it's, like, um, like, you're stuck in, like, the cave and then, like, you're presented information once you leave the cave and it's your choice whether to stay outside the cave with this information or go back into the cave um um so like a lot of like my life like a lot of the things I've learned about being like a good person I like to attribute that to The Last Airbender which is my <laughs> ultimate favorite most favorite show in the entire world um Legend of Korra 2 like the entire Avatar series is very interesting I mean if you look at like my shelf over there I, over there I have like all the Avatar The Last Airbender comics oh cool um, working cool. on Legend of Korra soon um and then that's also why I wanted to join video games too because it's like fiction like reading fiction but like you get to interact with it too so like working in video games it's a lot of people see it as like just entertainment but it's also like an art and art has the ability to teach and send a message so my goal is to send the right message to everybody or at least the people that buy the game <laughs> hopefully we get to the point where like I can just it's like since it's so popular I could do something like what Skyrim is like here's just the game of the year edition for free just take it <laughs> um so yeah just consume as like as much fiction as you can to like learn about stuff and like especially if you're creative because that's where you're going to get all your inspiration I mean I don't like saying that almost nothing is original anymore but that's almost completely true I mean if you listen to the Star Wars soundtrack it's just the planet suite by Holst pretty much the same <laughs> thing ex- with the John Williams spin on it <laughs> So uh, <laughs> don't be afraid to like draw inspiration. Just don't plagiarize. <laughs> Dude, I, I'd love, and something I want to highlight too in you is that your open-mindedness and willingness to explore other mediums and other disciplines. Um, I remember having a, a conversation with my band director way back in high school where he said that like as a professional, it's really easy to go and explore like um, musicals, concerts, mm-hmm. different genres and that. But to go to like an art gallery or to experience other forms of entertainment isn't something that we necessarily do very often. Um, so yeah. I think it's really awesome that you that you that you're that you're uh, embracing it. Like fiction, I I I I um I'm the same way, right? I feel like with anyone, um, you just kind of bring a more informed opinion with the more yeah. life that you live. <laughs> That's really yeah. all it is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and each piece of fiction is like a separate life. <laughs> yeah. And I, I love how you talk about the different inspirations you have and not only fiction, but I'm guessing that video games have inspired you as well. So, mm-hmm. for example, for me, video games has taught me the, the value of putting time limits on things to help get, <laughs> to, to increase the urgency to get jobs done for whether it's tasks in the personal life or, uh, you know, professionally. Um, how have games inspired you to grow as a person? Yeah, uh, I think one of the really li- nice analogies I like to use is the state of magic in Skyrim. So after the Oblivion... Oh my god, sorry, I'm going to get a bit nerdy. But after the Oblivion crisis, the populace was like, oh my god, magic is bad. I mean, look at what it did to our world. Um, so people like just like, they started shunning like magicians, and or that's not what they call them, but like people that use magic. Um, except under their noses, they've been using a different kind of magic the entire time, and that magic is alchemy. Uh, and there's sort of a real world parallel to that. So like, um, like right now there's like this whole anti-science movement going on with like anti-vax and stuff like that. But like the thing is, they've been using science their entire time. Like science is present in everything they do and especially cooking. Like you can't live without cooking, which is also why I have the food lab by J. Kenji Lopez. It's like the intersection of science and, uh, culinary arts. Like it's really important to like take two subjects and cross it over and like, or all subjects pretty much. But, um, video games has taught me that like you need to perceive things as they intersect not as like from different lenses like I know people talk about different lenses like you need to look at this from like a political lens a social lens an economic lens but like you need to also consider the fact that you can't take these parts away from them like you have to consider them as a whole um and that's also a part of like one of the things I did at GSA was go to conferences and one of them they talked about was interdisciplinary interdiscipline it's inter wait not that's a different one intersectionality that's the word I was looking for where it's like you're not just a gay person and you're not just an Asian person you are a gay Asian person and you can't take that experience away from other people or you can't take those experiences apart because that's like a unique experience that you need to take in a part of and I just apply that to like every other subject possible 
um, and especially music. Like in all my classes, whenever there's a project where like you get to do your own thing, which is pretty common in college because they want you to have like organic learning. Um, I'm like, okay, so I'm just going to write music for this project <laughs> or do something music related. Like for my history project, I'm doing, um, my topic is disco music and how it impacted awesome. people of color and uh, the LGBT community in the 70s and how it's impacting uh, those communities in the present. Uh, and I'm focusing a lot on Donna Summer, um, yes. Michael Jackson, yes. when he was in his <laughs> disco era, uh, Sylvester, which not a lot of people oh, know yes. about, but he's a nice. California. Oh my God, I took a yeah. disco, dude, we can talk more after this because I took a whole history of disco class too and learned all this stuff too, man. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just hoping that like this paper, which I'm going to send to like a histo- uh, the Lambda Archives here in San Diego, which focuses on collecting all the experiences of like, um, um, like the LGBT people here in um, San Diego, is that like you get like a new perspective of like the interdisciplinarity of music and also like the social activism, social justice, um, and like you can apply that to everything. So um, I don't know people just need to keep that in mind. Like it's not just like what you said a you versus me mentality. You're just basically applying that to like things in life. Like instead of just thinking of one thing, just think of like the us, and just be like, well this this and this and this and this and it requires a lot of brain power and like if you try to text me i'm probably just brain dead at that moment like that's <laughs> <laughs> like the i guess the big like downfall of like having such big thinking is that like you don't have energy energy for anything else so like burnout is something i've experienced multiple times and i'm currently in an era of burnout right now but i have projects going on so i just need to like keep pushing i'm getting better at recovering quicker and that's part of the interdisciplines of life i guess because mm-hmm. it's uh i i i have of my own philosophy on the different disciplines of life that i have at the um that are important to me we've talked about this before finances mm-hmm. relationships education service and health so those are the five like disciplines in life for me to have um for me to be happy essentially mm-hmm. and also speaking about interdisciplines it, i think that speaks towards video games in general, right? Because there's so many disciplines that have to come together in order to have an amazing gaming experience. It's not just the graphics. Mm -hmm. It's not just the sound. It's not just the design. It's Mm -hmm. not just the business, but it's all of these things coming together to really make amazing experiences. And Mm -hmm. um, the fact that you are now coming in from a musical expertise and then now you're getting into putting games together where you're having all of the disciplines come together i think that's a great analogy for you know the world and how we can all have our all our, our individual specialties and bring them in together to make an awesome experience for others to be able to share as well so um thank you so much for just bringing your mindset your um your insights to this podcast and uh, like i know that i've learned a ton and i'm sure the audience has as well um and like just to see that you and byron also have that connection with regards to music like to mm-hmm. see your guys' faces light up when you're talking about disco i'm like i i'm, I'm not sure what that is but <laughs> that was pretty cool yeah. and it's all for so, video games <laughs> yeah there yeah. you go um so this is Mr. Byron, uh, I'll, I'll let you take it from here. I know we're kind of getting close to the end, um, so I'll, I'll let you lead the way from here going on. Yeah, yeah sure. sure. And, and so it's... as we end um, this episode of the of the podcast, um, I know you're not in the industry, but you've already made great strides and improvements to get there. So are there any lessons that you'd like to kind of point out for the audience that kind of stuck out to you above the rest? And then afterwards, um, feel free to... Um, tell people where they can find you. Um, I don't know if you have a portfolio online or your LinkedIn, um, stuff like that. Um, I So one of the biggest things, I knew that networking was going to be a big thing going into the music industry. But now that I'm in video game industry and I found out that a lot of these job positions aren't exactly posted, networking is like of the utmost importance. So try to get connected with, with as many people as possible. Um, but like, don't like, push yourself too much because like I know that that can be a great difficulty for certain people so like do it naturally do it in a way that makes you comfortable but make sure you get those connections as soon as possible um in terms of finding me you can find me on uh Instagram and SoundCloud they have the same name it's d.alcones music um a lot of my music pro- or all my music projects pretty much are posted on SoundCloud or at least all the f- ones that I finished on Ableton and on Instagram I po- I try to post as many updates on my musical life as possible 
Um, once I get the video from the performance, I'm going to put some videos of my solos, which were pretty good. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to be part of the core ensembles next semester, so I'm going to post a lot of videos of me singing too, eventually, um, in a group. Not solo, just yet, because I get nervous about that sort of stuff. So yeah, d.alcona's music. Um, feel free to message me on there too if you ever want to connect, and you can also find my LinkedIn. It's just Donovan Alcones. Um, yeah, that's where you can find me. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for agreeing to come on to the podcast. I know you had a busy weekend, 18 units, <laughs> plus creating that club and the commissions and all the others. Dude, I was a music major too. I understand the schedule's busy, so yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate um, you coming onto the podcast. And um, yeah, so that, that concludes this episode. Um, thanks so much for listening and watching. Um, and yeah, wanted to make sure that you guys know that we are on YouTube. Um, we're posting right now. It's every Friday, um, 10 a.m. That's when you can find it, 10 a.m. Pacific. Um, and if you kind of want to know more about the podcast or you want to see highlights, we also have tick We're also on TikTok at Empower Up Podcast. Um, we're all, well, basically, we're on all the socials. We're on um, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, thanks so much for watching, guys. And we'll see you on the next episode.